Okay, so there are a lot of topics to cover in this talk, so I think we shall start now with the next session here. So I'm very happy to, happy to introduce the next speaker. It's Mark McGregor, who besides his other various activities is currently head of strategy at Signavio. And before that was a research director at Gartner covering EA tools. And he also worked on four books covering uh, business and process management. And now he will tell us why it's time to rethink your approach to enterprise architecture. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Boy, oh boy, what a challenge. I'm so used to talking to BPA, BPM to an EA audience or EA to a BPM audience, and here we are talking about EA to an EA audience. Well, that's what I thought. But then when I listened to the first couple of presentations and listened to some of the discussions, I wasn't so sure. So I thought I'd just start by asking you guys a couple of questions, see just how wrong I'm going to be. Um, so I'm make, going to make an assumption, it's an EA conference, so you're all involved in EA. How many of you have business architecture as part of your remit within your group? Mm, a few people. So now you can see why it gets scary, right? Because how can you be doing enterprise architecture if you're not doing business architecture? Ah, so we have a room of IT architects masquerading as enterprise architects. Now you're going to start to see the problem that you have. Not me, but you. Um, so, OK, that's pretty scary. Um, OK, so second question, before I totally derail my presentation. How, much of your t how many of you spend 40% or more of your time working on future state as opposed to yeah, if you think, I want to put my hand up here. I don't really, but I've got it. OK, so, hmm, this suggests that you're still too busy analysing the past. Now, let's just jump into retail for a moment and think, what's the point in spending 70% of your time analysing what's happening in a physical retail store today? Is that going to help you compete with Zalando? Or do you need to be thinking, actually, we've got to do what we can with our physical stores. We've got to get up there and compete with the online. But what do we really need to be doing? Where's it going next? Someone laughed at me in 2005 when I suggested that Amazon was totally wrong. I said, how can they be? The guy's making bucket loads of money. He's got it perfectly right. And I said, the business model of the future we bricks and clicks. I said, don't be stupid. Everyone knows bricks are dead. It's all about clicks. Where's Amazon today? Increasingly looking at how they can meld bricks and clicks. No, they're not rushing off creating stores everywhere. But they recognize that a pure online is not the way to be and that there's some combination of bricks and clicks. Oh, so maybe the fact that we've got all of those stores isn't necessarily a bad thing, but the way that we use them may change. And maybe that comes into some of the experiences. So yeah, I, my background is around a little bit on BPM and EA. I say a little bit um, for those of you that don't know me. I'm a pretty sad individual, and working in the Berlin tech crowd with Signavio is really embarrassing um, because I started out in the modeling and architecture and process world in 1994 when most of my colleagues weren't even born. <laughs> but it raises an interesting paradigm because the same is true in many of your organizations around enterprise architecture. Because you, many of your teams are going out there and making the same mistakes. We're not actually willing to listen and learn from the past. Oh, we got rid of those guys. We've got a new team now. And it's all going behind. You know, in, in neurolinguistic programming and life coaching, we teach people that you want your past somewhere about here, at like a 45 degree angle. So as you're looking forward, you can keep seeing that you're doing it. When the past is behind you, you're destined to keep making the same mistakes over and over again. 
pretty scary. So here's the chart, here's the choice. It's not an analyze the past, design the future. Just make a simple choice. Do you wish to suffer the future or enjoy it? Because that's really what it's about. And that's the choices that you have to make. As was said in the introduction, um, my last full-time role was as an analyst at Gartner. I wrote the 2016 Magic Quadrant for EA Tools, did most of the work for the 2017 Magic Quadrant, and during my time with Gartner took around about 1,000 inquiry calls from enterprise architecture teams in the office of the CIO. So you can imagine the complete diverse range of questions. Or were they so diverse? We'll see. So, here's the news for you. If you think you're succeeding today, that's great, but you've got a lot of work to do. Because I'm going to mix up some stuff, by the way, so I'm going to share some, some data as we go through. There's bits that are public from Gartner, there's bits that are public from Forrester, there's bits that I've done with some other EA tool vendors, there are surveys that I've done myself, so I'm picking a whole bunch of things, so I'm not just, shall we say, over-borrowing one source of information. So the, the stats that I share with you come from a number of different sources. 66% of architecture initiatives fail. Hmm. And the funny thing is, that some of the most popular research that's written by analysts is all about restarting, renewing, or refreshing EA initiatives. And it seems to be happening that even if you're in the success category today, I will lay a small wager that within two years, you'll be speaking to an analyst or a consultant saying, we need to restart, refresh, or rethink constantly. Hmm. Because largely what it meant is we didn't keep changing. So in this session, there's a number of things that I'm going to try and cover. We may not get to them all. Um, but when talking with the guys at the LX, we were talking about a whole bunch of things. I said, well, OK, what sort of things would you like? I said, well, OK, you wrote the quadrant. So talk to us a bit about why great tools don't get the analyst coverage they deserve. Now, even though some of you are customers, and you might think, well, I've already got it. I'm bought into it. Believe me, you still need the same information, because at some point, someone's going to say, why are we renewing on this tool? Why do you want to increase the usage? So the same thing goes whether you're buying for the first time, justifying staying with the investment, or looking to expand the scope of what you're doing. I want to talk about a little bit some of the key use cases for enterprise architecture, delivering true business value. Talk a little bit about business outcomes on ROI around that adoption, expansion of your EA programs initiatives. I'll talk a little bit around one size doesn't fit all when you're thinking about tooling. And hopefully have a few minutes to look at some of the intersections of um, BPM and EA. Because I've got so much material to try and squeeze into a short time, um, I'm going to drive the microphone team mad. Because as you have questions, interrupt me as we go through, because I may run out of time for the Q&A, and you may all want to talk to me at lunchtime. But I'm going to be here all day, so happy to talk with some of the discussions offline. Some of the questions, I may choose to just park them, because I'm a real believer that we've got a large room full of people. And some of the questions may be very specific to an individual, in which case I may suggest we take them offline. Is that OK? Cool. So let's start with. Uh, why don't great tools get the analyst coverage they deserve? It's the most common question that I've been asked over the last 15, 16 years, whether I was working at Gartner, whether I was working at MWD Advisors, whether I was working at Bloor Research, or even just working for myself. And the reason is, of course, you all love a magic wave. Okay, you know, the vendors are all crying because they're down in the bottom left-hand corner. You telling me it's much easier to get a business case approved for that magic waving superior thing. And you know, if I'm down here and seen as visionary or whatever describing, then hey, that's a pretty cool place to be. And as a challenger or however the description goes, that seems pretty good too. So why aren't your favorite tools featured? Is the magic wand tool really the best? Are you running a risk by using something 
that doesn't appear? And how do you justify some of those non-magic wave tools? So I'm going to make the assumption that most of you in this room have looked at a, a quadrant or a wave or some other graphic that an analyst firm produces, right? How many of you have read the underlying reports on which those are based? Yeah, there's a few of you, great. And I'll lay a small wager that the bits you've read will be the analysis of the market, um, you'll have uh, read the descriptors and the strengths and weaknesses for each of the vendors. Yeah, and um, we'll use that to inform, no doubt, produce your shortlist or whatever you're producing. Okay. One of my contributions when I was at Gartner in the EA tool space was to separate core capabilities of an EA tool from critical capabilities. So now let me ask the question that said, if you look at the last couple of years, how many of you have looked at the critical capability assessment for EA tools? Hmm. Funny thing is, that report is where we actually judge the tools. Because you know that in a magic wave, to blend the terms, you know that the products aren't actually evaluated, don't you? You know that they're evaluations of the vendor, not the product? Hmm. So hang on a minute. You're telling me that XYZ, who's up there in the leading, you didn't say it was the leading product? No. We said it was a good product, they seem to know what they're doing, they seem to understand the market. It's an evaluation of the vendor. The critical capabilities reports, those are evaluations of the tools. And if you're a customer of those various analyst firms, then you can actually go and use, in, in, in God's case, my capability. You can actually use it as an online and create your own and reassess the criteria. Because even when someone scores really, really well in a critical capabilities assessment, what do they score well against? They score well against the three use cases that I or someone else as an analyst perceived as the use cases we wanted to evaluate. Is that the same as your use case? Maybe, probably not. Ah, so if my use case is different, then the ranking and evaluation of the tools is going to be completely different. Hmm. Just something to bear in mind when you're leveraging and using magic waves. So actually, the associative reports are more relevant. Now, if we look at the EA one in particular, it's a nightmare. You know, we've got apples, pears, oranges, kiwi fruits, all in the same bucket. You know, there are tools that are somewhere down here that are very much IT drawing tools. And everywhere in between. So don't be fooled by the picture. One of the things that I suggest to you is that actually read the user-generated reviews. So just as an example, because I thought it would make um, some useful stuff. So I extracted some stuff which my colleagues at Gartner, I'm sure, won't mind me borrowing and sharing with you, because any analyst that's ever written a magic quadrant wants people to read these three paragraphs, which no one ever reads. Oh, placement is not an indicator of the needs of an organization. Inclusion doesn't mean that they're capable of resolving the challenges of new or intermediate. Oh, OK. So the tools may not be right for me. The quadrant describes them a diverse market of vendors. Specific problems require niche solutions. Does it, oh, yeah, hang on a minute. Or more to the point, it focuses, as I said, on the placement in the market, not the product. Other stuff that I've not copied out, but for every magic quadrant, you already know why your, quote, favorite vendor isn't covered. Because if you go to the end of the report, it says, this is the criteria we used. They must be doing X of revenue. They must have geographical presence of Y. We must have X number of inquiries on them. It's like, oh, OK. Oh, well, actually, if I want to get my favorite 
vendor included, all I need to do is to quadruple my spend with them and get my friends to do the same, phone Gartner every five minutes with an inquiry about what do you think about them, and I can increase their chances of being on the quadrant. Well, that's one. But the other thing is, oh, the vendor has to address what Gartner or Forrester or whoever describes as the capabilities on which they wish to judge the market. Well, this is a 20-year-old market with many 20- or 30-year-old tools. Ah, hang on a minute. Are we actually judging yesterday's tools by yesterday's standards so when someone comes up with a new tool to do something new in a different way, it inevitably isn't going to carry it. I would suggest to you that if Lean IX was to build a product roadmap to get them into the magic wave, you wouldn't buy the product. Because they'd have to add so much complexity and so much stuff in that you'd say, you know what, this wasn't the simple business value usable product that I wanted. Because they'd have to focus on drawing all sorts of different things. They'd have to build in customer journey mapping. They'd have to um, build in things like surveys. They'd be having to build in whole different analysis tools. And you'd say, well, I don't want to do that. Yeah, go back to the previous presentation for those of you who were in the room. Oh, we don't need to, we're not here about, we're not a software development organization. You know, we're orchestrating or we're using, oh yeah, we don't need that. It's more about portfolio. So. I think that the user reviews are a better example. And here's just some that I picked at random for Lean IX. They're up there on the Gartner Peer Insights thing today. Now, what I thought would be kind of fun, just to give you an illustration, was, OK, if I look at the overall ratings, how does your favorite tool compare with the Magic Wave tools? Well. Of the Magic Quadrant featured vendors this year, only three of the vendors in the entire quadrant, regardless of which square they appear in, are actually theoretically rated higher by the users that use them. Eight of them actually score lower. So don't just consider those pictures. OK, so use cases. <sighs> Love it. It was the, one of the favorite topics of conversation. 84% of EAs either don't use use cases or use the wrong use cases when justifying tooling. <laughs> Small surprise, it's challenging to get budget. Hence the last statistic. 51% of people going and requesting budget for EA tooling get it turned down because it's too IT focused and not business value centric. And here I want to touch on something that the previous speaker, and I was talking to him afterwards, and link the Zalando talk with the Detcon talk. The guy from Detcom was constantly talking about customer and you know, the self-managing teams and agile now has customer experience in there. So, I don't want you to have customer experience in your agile team. It's my bleeding business. I decide what customer experience I want. Now, within your team, I would like you to focus on the user experience that I might want from whatever it is I want you to build, but you don't run my company. So let's not keep using these big words like customer um, in a small sense. Because one of the challenges I had with the previous speaker was when he was using customer and I used the word customer, we mean the people outside of your organization that spend the money that decide whether you're in business. I won't ask or embarrass anyone by getting anyone to put their hands up that says, I wonder how many organizations that are working in teams where the word customer means finance or it's HR or it's some other part of your own organization. You know, your colleagues, your stakeholders, your managers, your partners. And we come to think of them as customers. And I put it to you that that's the reason that many organizations can't deliver great customer experience. Because most of the organization thinks they're doing a great job for the customer. 
trouble is, the people outside the organisation that are spending with us, they don't think we're doing a great job as a company. And no one can understand it, and it's because we're using the same word in different ways. Which is why I touch on the Zolando talk this morning that said, yeah, maybe we really should get a glossary. Maybe we, but never mind the technical terms, let's be really clear on what does customer mean in our organisation? What does a stakeholder mean? When we say it's an autonomous team, what do we actually mean? You know, because are they really autonomous? Or are we saying, actually, I've decided that, you know, I want a new HR application, and you can be totally autonomous in delivering that application within 12 months with this core set of capability. Because I don't care how you build it, you know? I really don't care whether you all get together, you do it in a walk, because the delivery mechanism, we don't mind about. But we do care about getting what we, was we wanted. So one of the things that I find amusing about Agile, history repeating itself, most of you are too young to have used RAD in the mid-90s, but you all know that the... But you're bound to have heard the joke that RAD just means you can get the wrong system faster than ever before. Agile just means you don't even know what system you're going to get because the Agile team said, we decide what a minimum viable product is and you get what we give you when we're ready. Which may or may not be what you thought because we're autonomous. Now, OK, I'm not suggesting that all teams operate in that way. Um, but many of the younger teams certainly do because the only thing they have is a book and a training course to go on. They don't have any life experience. So just be a little cautious. So what do the analysts talk about in terms of use cases? So here I've picked a little bit from Forrester and a little bit from, from Gartner and looking at what they found from surveys. And what you can see here is still that from an EA perspective, most of that work that the EA said they're doing is still largely technical. And yet, if I ran the same questions and surveys to the CEOs, COOs, line of business managers, how much of that stuff is really important to them? Not a lot. Is this why, suggestion, many EA initiatives are failing? Because they're not perceived as adding the value. Now, if we looked at it and said, our IT architecture initiatives failing, not necessarily. Oh, but that's because we were doing IT architecture and we called it enterprise architecture. So the reason for much of the perception gap, again, is we're using a big label and confusing IT architecture for the enterprise, which is and, I, and I, I talked to um, our previous speaker about it, for me, largely what he was describing, as opposed to enterprise architecture. And you could argue that in some organisations, they already have, in fact, in any organisation, there was an argument that said they've already got an enterprise architect. What do you think his day job is? CEO. Now, you could say, well, that's a bit of abstract. Well, think about it. What's the purpose of a CEO? It's to bring all the different disparate parts of the organisation together in a connected way towards a common goal to deliver value for the stakeholders. That's a bit like enterprise architecture, really, isn't it? Hmm. So maybe, and we saw a lot of this, that effective EA teams, or sorry, the most effective EA teams report to CEOs and COOs, not CIOs. Because if they don't have the business architecture and they're not connecting to the business goals, they're not getting that connect connectivity. So I had a little look on those Gartner use cases scenarios. Those are some of the things they use on the Gartner Peer Insights. So, you know, sometimes statistics don't actually help you get where you want to go, but they're still worth sharing. So I had a look through those Peer Insights and said, well, okay, let me compare what LeanIX customers and how the, the use case is ranked for how many people were using it for these things versus the leaders. And I just picked a, an example leader off a quadrant. I'm not going to say who it was because it doesn't matter. And just had a look and said, well, let me do a comparison. You know, are the tools being used differently? And I think the, 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 the only one that really sticks out was the actual process part, interestingly enough, which is not, too, not surprising here from a Lean IX point of view. Okay, because, you know, as 
my colleagues that are out there, Matthias and, and Robbie, will say, hey, you know what, that's the partnership with Signavio, that's great, because it's not historical modelling, whereas these tools have got all the historical modelling on. But this was a little worrying. Only a little worrying, and just, you just need to think about this and bear it in mind that these are the key business things that the business people are interested in. And if you can't find a way of applying what you guys are doing to that, and by the way, this is not a tool functionality issue, much of it is a language issue. <coughs> um, and let me give you an example. Um, totally changed and anonymized, but talking to someone who was basically saying, look, I need help, and the help I need is that I can't get budget for a Windows 10 upgrade. Well, you know, what's the business outcome? Well, you know, it'll be so much cheaper to maintain and it's so much easier to roll out. And yeah, yeah, it's pretty well, what's it going to cost? 10 million. Oof, I wouldn't spend it either. He said, well, that's my problem. I really, really need to do it and I need your help. And I said, OK, well, let's suppose that we roll out Windows 10. What actual difference is it going to make on anyone's desktop? So let's imagine I'm a customer service rep. Oh, well, you know, they're going to have access to information quicker. Hmm, that could be interesting. Oh, and they can get access to all the information. I'm sorry, you can, they can get access to all the information they need quicker so that they can answer more of the queries first time? Well, yeah. And they can improve the productivity because they can take more calls? Yeah. Have you tried talking to the CEO about that? No. Sure enough, goes to the CEO, says, by the way, I've got this way of increasing productivity, delivering that, and increasing customer satisfaction was number two on your list of priorities this year. He called me back and said, you know, the CEO didn't even ask how much I needed. He didn't ask, sorry, he asked how much I needed, 10 million, didn't ask what I was going to do with the money. He said, you, you gave me what I wanted. I want to move the needle from here to here. You told me if I give you this money, you can move the needle. The fact that you're going to do it through a Windows 10 desktop upgrade, that's for you to worry about. So even with what you guys are doing around some of the stuff around portfolio, what can we do here? Is there better ways of managing? So think about doing that. And another way of looking at it is this one. Um, if you look at all the red blocks, or all the high ones that the architecture team say they're working on, but if you look at all the green ones that they're not doing much with, those are the ones the business care about. Now, that's not saying that the other things aren't important. And remember, I'm not suggesting anyone's doing anything wrong or that they've got to immediately switch. I'm just sharing with you that if you feel you're not getting the traction that you want within your organisations, or you're not getting the budget or the recognition that you think you want, then maybe you need to think about how what I do as an individual, how what you do as teams, can be switched from these to addressing these. If your goal is to stand up a long-term, successful, viable enterprise architecture initiative. Hey, if I'm happy doing IT or asset management stroke portfolio, then fine, don't worry about it. You can still do fantastic work and deliver real value to the business, or sorry, real value to the IT department, because if you think about it, um, portfolio rationalization is not necessarily seen as a business value, it's an IT value, because he's trying to cut his budget, it was all nailed down. Now, of course, we can always go into the, yes, but if we can save money here, we can spend it over here, which has business value, which is usually a really good thing. So, I suggest that you need to use real business outcomes if you want to demonstrate ROI, and, and I've oversimplified this just for today. So, hang on a minute. Application rationalization, data center consolidation, Standardization, Internet of Things. So what? So what? <coughs> I, I loved the discussion just before the break there about um, shadow IT. I love it because it's like the wrong discussion. For as long as your CMO has got the budget, he'll decide what systems he's going to use. It's not a discussion over 
who's, who's got most control, the discussion is, how do I work with them that they choose to give me a chunk of their budget as opposed to spend it with Salesforce? Now, I'll share some advice I used to share with a number of clients who would get very frustrated as architects and CIOs around this and say, change the discussion. You know, you've, from that governance with a capital G to guidance with a small g. And what you say is, hey, no problem, Mr. CMO, I can understand that you want Salesforce. No issue at all. Use what you want. HubSpot, Gainsight, all, no issue at all. A couple of questions. Um, in the event of a data breach, you are going to explain to the CEO why we've picked up this massive $20 billion fine. What do you mean? Well, you know, when we start putting all these disparate apps together and linking them with APIs, stuff leaks out. But if you're happy with that responsibility, oh, hang on, well, what can you do to help me? If you're happy the fact that you can't actually take that Salesforce data and put it into our back-end SAP system, no problem. Oh, no, actually, I do need them working together. Oh, right, so integration and data security. Are... Yeah, maybe you guys can come and help me. Right, so now we're not trying to stop Shadow IT. We recognise that it's his spend, but we just remind them that along with the spend goes the responsibility. So just because you decided that you didn't want to come and invest in our slightly longer, heavier weight way of doing things, because you could see a quicker way, that's OK but you now have to run with the implications and take the responsibility. In many organisations, not in all, things will change because they suddenly realise that, actually, I'm not willing to take responsibility and accountability. I just, just wanted the app. So think about mergers and acquisitions. How, how does what you do help there? And a lot of the stuff that you guys have been doing and Linux around that portfolio management, is massively useful in mergers and acquisitions. You, know, you imagine that you take something like Zalando we're talking about this morning in terms of grabbing a lot of that stuff automatically. So let me get this right. As a part of due diligence, I could go and point these sniffers at my target company, build the catalog pretty quickly, high level, map the catalog to my current catalog, and immediately see where there's an overlap, where there are gaps, and what's going on. Hmm. Think that could have an impact today on the likely integration aspects in an M&A situation? Yeah. And let's face it, a pretty significant cost implication. But how many of us think about how the work that we do can be applied in that way? Digital transformations, that's a tough one for you guys. A tough one, a great opportunity. Tough because you really do have to integrate very tightly with um, customer journeys and with process to get there. But Two areas of digital transformation that are really hot, RPA. I'm sure it's hot on many of your agendas. You know, but RPA is like an iPhone, isn't it? The moment you've bought it, it's out of date. How many different robots from how many different vendors are you likely to have in your organisation? A significant number. They probably don't talk to each other. Most analysts will tell you whatever bots you put in place today are going to be obsolete in two years' time because technology is moving so fast. Well, if someone isn't running and managing that portfolio of robots and the implication of where they're used and what it means, you've got a massive problem. Mm, yeah, so actually digital transformation plays a really massive... An, an IoT is another example. All those different devices that are all throwing different types of data at different times. Whoa, I guess that's my warning. <laughs> and that's a warning. So, new business model, customers, how, think about how you can either talk about what you do and how it helps, or as you go back and rethink the functionality and capability you have within your teams and within in your tooling, think, well, what else could we be doing? And I'll just throw this one out there, uh, and it's you know, it may not be lean IX's thing, but I'm not selling their stuff, so that doesn't matter to me. Um, but if I look at the essence and say, well, you know, it's actually a really pretty good portfolio tool, right? But there's lots of things that are just portfolios within my organisation. You know, portfolios of devices. Oh, portfolios of processes. Could I think about data as a portfolio of data sources? and other such things. Could I have a portfolio of partners? Yeah. Lots of different things. 
Could you use it in those different ways? So <coughs> here's um, yesterday's EA tools. And they're really, really good. Okay, they're really, really excellent. And I have to say this, because don't forget, I started marketing, selling, promoting, and strategizing these things in 1994. <laughs> Worked with or for most of the, the vendors that you've ever seen in a magic quadrant. And in case any of you ever bought from any of the companies that I was promoting from, I want to remind you that at the time you bought the right thing. Because um, we were confused then. But we're not confused now. And let's face it, and technology was different. I mean, you know, joking apart, we didn't have, we didn't have cloud, although I, I can't sometimes struggle with cloud because I was having dinner with some of my colleagues the other night and because um, I'm too old, I was saying that computing for me was most fun in the mid 80s. I said, you know, in the first iteration of cloud, I said, you can't have had cloud. I said, well, cloud is just about saying I do all the work centrally and very little outside, isn't it? You know, in principle. So when I was installing an IBM mainframe and sticking a whole bunch of dumb terminals everywhere, I was just building clouds inside the organization, wasn't I? Oh, so the only thing that's changed now is the, the distance that we can put between the center and the outside, and the outsides are theoretically a little more intelligent, but it's actually not that much more intelligent when we're doing it all in a browser. Um, but theoretically, so the only thing that's changed is the wire. You know, I guess it's a bit more like mobile phones. It's all the things that's changed in 30 or 40 years, we've cut the wire. So when we look at the changing face of enterprise architecture, I've talked about architecture as a discipline a little bit, but now let's look at it from a, a mix up some of the tool stuff with some of the initiatives. Why would you want most of those legacy things that are on-premise in a world that's going cloud-based? It's not a specialist area. If you look at the, the, one of the strengths of Lean IX, which, you know, there's many things we can talk about which are common between Lean IX and Signavio. And the success of the organizations has some parallels. It's the democratization is the key word. Signavio's success is not building process modeling tools for process modelers. It's building process modeling tools for non-process modelers. Lean IX's true success is not about building an EA tool for EAs. It's about helping create tools that enable EAs to create and use stuff which is used throughout the organization. It's that lack of use that strangled all of the old tools. They can sell fewer and fewer tools to a smaller and smaller group of people who pay more and more for the same thing. Da -da 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 -da. So it's about moving from the few to the many. If you're still thinking that your success is about building fact sheets in the Lean AX world, then you're doomed. In the same way as the user of the legacy tools creating a model, nobody wants models. They have problems that models help them solve. No one wants a portfolio. They have a problem that a portfolio approach will help them solve. So think about those outcomes. It's not about the artifacts and the creation, it's the outcome. It's not about creation of those things. It's about the dissemination of that information widely and having it used. That way things don't get dusty. From models, we move to decisions. What's the decision you want to make? If we look at that challenge, as I talked about on the Agile teams, the reason that we get screwed up on autonomy is we're not making it clear which decisions are within their remit and which ones fall outside of their remit. It's not about cost. It's about value. So I think it's about having a set of good knives, as any good cook or good chef would say, to use a paring knife to gut the fish is probably not a smart move. And butter knives don't do very well with steak. So just to finish off, from a Signavio perspective, we would, all, we would always argue, when we're looking at the combination, it doesn't matter what any of you do or what any of your organizations do, it's not about what you do. It's about how you do it. That's what gets results. And no, I'm not going to sing the song for anyone that's old enough to remember it. Because um, Fun Boy 3 and Banana Rama is not something most of you would have heard about. So, but the funny thing is, and one of my pet peeves, is in the process world, 
We've got a Six Sigma team doing one thing with their tool. We've got the continuous improvement teams using theirs, ISO. All of these process groups are all using different tooling. But the funny thing is, I've only got one order to cash process, right? Within the business, I have an order to cash process. Do I want it to be compliant? Do I want parts automated? Oh, yeah, I want all of those things, but on the process. I don't need 25 representations of the same thing and the one that's missing. You know one that's missing in most organisations? The way we actually do things around here. It's usually the one that's not documented. Now, but those processes are supported or use data, applications, technology, etc. And that's where that integration uh, works so well and you can't see it because Christian is running the other track which is actually demonstrating the integration so we're actually we thought it was kind of fun that he's presenting BPM and I'm presenting EA and there's something really really strange there so we think just to finish the at Signavio that we want to help you unleash the power of process the guys on the stand are happy to talk you through that um, suite that we have around process because it's not just around the process modeling it's around the mining the capture the intelligence and as you see as i just talked about having that hub where that stuff can be centrally contained and then swallowing some of our own medicine we share with you and i'm not going to talk about because you can read it in the deck here's what our users had to say about it in terms of using signavio and how it's changed their world so I want to thank you all for listening and for your attention. Um, I suspect that we're out of time for questions. I am going to be here. Well, if he thinks you've got one, we'll take it. Yeah, but it literally, is. happy to talk with any of you over the breaks or whatever. I hope that um, I've made you a little uncomfortable in some ways, because if I haven't, I've failed. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, giving you some ideas to, as you get, become uncomfortable, as how you can get more comfortable. And that all is not lost. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>